Morning, everybody. Man, it's great to have you with us today. Uh, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm married to a woman named Rachel. And a couple years ago, Rachel and I, we finally bought our house, which is super awesome. We were excited about it. We spent a lot of time working hard, paying off debt, saving money, all those things. We bought the house, and we loved it, the location, all the things. But there's a lot of things in the house that were kind of outdated, and we needed to renovate them. There's something we had to fix. Like, and I mean, like, like renovate, not like we painted a wall and moved a couch, but like we like tore out all our, our floors or the tile and popcorn ceiling and the kitchen was totally torn out, everything like that. And we were like ready to do it. We saved up money. We we're like, all right, we're gonna do this. But we also don't have a ton of money, so we're gonna do a lot of the work ourselves. Because um, we knew how to do a bunch of that stuff because our parents growing up, we did that. Um, so we got ready to renovate it. And when I say we renovated our house, it's kind of like when couples say that we're pregnant. It's like one of you had about two minutes of fun and then the other one has to do all the difficult work for months and months. And in all fairness, like my wife has carried all of our kids and definitely I got the better end of the deal and she even helped with a lot of the renovations. But we get into it, we start doing this stuff and again, we tore out tile and we tore out a whole kitchen and put a whole new kitchen and all these things. And then we did a job, we tore out the, uh, removed the popcorn ceiling from our house. I don't know if you've ever done that. It's like, I don't suggest it. It is the worst thing in the world. You gotta like spray it and scrape it and it's messy. And then you gotta sand it because we want a nice smooth surface on the, the ceiling. So I bought this tool, a little handheld sand that you like plug into your, your thing. And then I'm like, all right, I'm gonna start sanding it. And, and like I go to the gym sometimes, like I lift heavy circles and things like that. So like I thought like I'll be okay. So I start using this sand. It's like a manual sander. There's no electricity. And I start doing this for about five minutes. And I thought, oh, sweet baby Jesus, no. <laughs> this is not gonna work out. So I go, I'm like, I'm literally five minutes in, I'm like, no, nope, we're done. So I go grab my phone. What is the biggest sander I can get the tool? So I got this nasty, like nine inch orbital sander. It looks like this. I uh, reach it, so I don't have to stand on a ladder or anything. And I, that thing will like, it will tear your skin right to the bone if you want it to. Like it will do some work. And I was like, this is awesome. I'm doing it and everything. And I, I learned through that, that having the right tool for the job makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? And so if you've built anything or worked on your car or anything, you know having the right tool really makes a big difference. But what happens is even through all our renovations, and you've probably had this as you've worked on things, like you get tempted to use the wrong tool for the job. And you're like, man, you know, it's a long walk to the garage. I don't want to walk that far much. And you try to, and it doesn't really ever work out like it's supposed to, does it? And you don't save any time. It makes it worse. Some of you were kind of elbowing someone next to you like, see, I told you, like, if you don't do that, then we won't have as many problems. But again, for so many of us, we use the wrong tool. And it, it, again, it never works out. But also what I'd say is not just with physical things we're building, but also in life, there are times where we're using a tool that maybe not even be, might not be a bad thing, but it's just not the right tool for the job, right? It's like a uh, like situation where like you're busy at work all week, you're really stressed, and you're like, I cannot wait till Friday. I get home, and I'm gonna get something from my refrigerator to help me de-stress, could be a bottle, it could be a cake, it could be anything. You're like, I'm gonna grab something and it's gonna help me de-stress. Or some of you are like, I'm just frustrated. Today didn't work out how I wanted to. The kids are the worst because the kids are absolute worst. And like, uh, you know what's gonna help me feel better? If I just go and just buy a few things online. But again, is buying stuff online wrong? No, of course it's not. But it's using something in a way it wasn't intended to meet a need or desire that you have. And it, it generally doesn't work out. Some of you, that's why you have another kid. Because you were like, we're really stressed out and their marriage is really tense. You know what will help this situation? A little baby. <laughs> because babies are known to like de-stress situations and bring all sorts of peace in the house, right? Some of you were like, you guys have another kid. Like, here's the deal. It's not because we fight so much. It's because we love having babies. You know what I'm saying? But, but here's the reality for all of us. I think culturally, one tool that we go to, that we look to, to meet a need that it, it is not intended to meet is we go to social media and you're feeling lonely and you're feeling bored and you're like, man, I just need some connection with someone. So I go to social media and you find some kind of connection. But here's the problem is social media is not meant to help you have meaningful, deep connections. And even in our world, we're more connected than ever, but we feel lonelier than ever. And we think that through having simply a giant circle of people we relate to, that those will be meaningful relationships, because that's what social media does. It creates a giant circle of people that you relate to. 
you relate to about your interests, about you went to school together, you're from the same area, you met them one time at your kid's thing and now they do sourdough too, so you're like, great, we can do that together. Like, like a bunch of people that you relate to and that's a good thing. Like you should have people that you relate to on all kinds of things, but it's not enough though. And again, what happens so often is with, with social media, which I'm not against social media, I have it, I use it. But again, you have to understand, it is not meant to meet the deepest desires for community in your life. But what we do is we generally think, well, it's not doing its job, so I just need more. I need more followers, more likes. I need to interact more. I need to be on my app more. But study after study after study is coming back, and the results are in. Social media is not good for your overall well-being. Even one study, it said that the more time individuals spend on social media, the more likely they are to feel, report feelings of loneliness and social isolation. You think, like, but it's social. Like, we're supposed to be together. And, and the reality is, simply having a circle of people you relate to is not enough. And again, what happens is we chase more, but more is not the solution to the, the whole you have around community. Meaningful is. It's having meaningful relationships. And meaningful relationships happen when we go from that giant relate circle, which we all should have that. You should have people, your coworkers and your neighbors, you should have people you relate to. You have this giant circle. When it moves from simply having people you relate to to having a smaller group of people that you trust, that's when you actually start to have meaningful relationships. That's when you actually start to have some of that community that you want, but some of us don't know how to find it. I'll tell you from the beginning, my whole goal today is to get you, to encourage you, to inspire you, to motivate you, to challenge you to join a group. We've been talking about groups for several weeks and we, we wanna point you to groups. I know for a lot of us, you're like, man, I am too busy for a group. Man, if you knew all the extracurriculars we got, I got this thing and that thing and my kids and I got work, like, I totally get it. The reality is somehow when the seasons change, I find about three hours to watch football on Saturday and about three more hours to watch football on Sunday. And for some of you, that's you. And what I would say is I think for a lot of us, if we're really honest, which is a great place to start, we have time for the things we want to have time for. So you're like, I'm just too busy. I get it. You are very busy, but you could find some time somewhere. Or for some of you, like, well, what if it's weird? What if it's uncomfortable? Like, what if they, are we going to have to do anything? Else? Like, here's the reality. It's probably going to be a little weird because I hate to tell you you're a little weird. <laughs> I'm a little weird too. Every single one of us is a little weird. Now, we don't set up the goal to be like, hey, let's keep groups weird. But the reality is you're going to have people in your group that you relate to, you connect with a little bit, and hopefully your weirds line up and you're like, great, we both like that thing together. But you might have something that's a little bit uncomfortable, but here's the reality. Would you rather be a little uncomfortable or feel alone? I'd rather be a little bit uncomfortable. Or for even some of us, you're like, man, is it like, like, what's the commitment? Is this like a blood oath society where we're like signing in blood and we're doing, even the way churches talk about groups is weird because like we're doing life together, which sounds more like a prison sentence and like a, <laughs> we're, like we're doing life, like why, what are you in for? I, no, the reality is with groups, you meet for about three months. Big easy on-ramp, that's today. And then a big easy off-ramp if you're like, our weirds don't line up. I need to get, and just imagine by Thanksgiving, you could move from having a bunch of people you relate to to having some people that you trust. But meaningful relationships require intention and time. You need to be intentional about it. You need to think about it. You need to plan around it. You need to focus your life around it. And I would argue you should do this because you can't control the situations you face. And life is going to throw something at you that's difficult. Like that's one thing we all have in common. We've all walked through difficulties. But while you can't control the situations you face, you can control the circle you sit in. And I think you should choose to sit in a circle. I think that that could be one of the biggest steps in your faith. And this is something actually uh, psychology and all these different fields of study actually agree on, which if any of those things all line up and point to something and say, hey, you should do this, you should pay attention. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, even if you're not sure about it, what I would say is you should just try it out because so many experts and so many fields point to the necessity of community for your well-being. 
And again, all these experts, experts point to that. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to see what there is to learn, and including the scriptures. And there's a letter called Hebrews that the author wrote to the early church, and they're trying to help them understand and remember that Jesus is supreme over everything else. That's why even here at Center Point, Jesus is our lead source, our first value as a church. Jesus is supreme over everything else. And this is how you live out your faith. This is how you hold on to your faith when difficulties come. And this is what the author of Hebrews wrote to the early church. And I think he also or she would also have for us as it relates to us getting in community. It says this in chapter 10. Let us consider how we may spur another, one another on towards, what's that first word? Let's try that again, church. What's the first word? Love. There you go. And what's the second thing? Good, Good deeds. deeds. So two things. We're supposed to push each other. Consider how we can push, irritate each other on towards love and good deeds. That word consider, that word spur, it's like you need to think about it and then you should bug someone to do something good. You should be totally focused on it. The, the reality is for so many of us, we're not very intentional with the relationships in our lives. And we're kind of all over. Or you're really intentional in some areas. Like you're really intentional with work and you're like, yeah, I'm really focused over here. But then you come home and you're like, ah, it's kind of like, oh, whatever. Or you're really focused on the, your kids, but your partner is kind of like last on the list. Or your own personal health is last on the list. Like, like so many of us, we live unintentionally. But the problem is when we live unintentional lives, it leads to undesirable lives. And some of you, like you've experienced this. You're like, man, the, the first step for us to be able to live lives of, full of love and good deeds is we need to be intentional. This is also an issue with relationships because for so many of us, our relationships are always, or just growing up, they've been predetermined for us. Think about it. It's the kids in your neighborhood. Those are like your earliest friends or your family members. Or then you go on, it's your classmates and your sports team people and then your coach. And then you get older and it's the same kind of thing. It's kids in your class, it's kids on your team, kids in your neighborhood. You go to college, it's your sorority sisters, your fraternity brothers, the people in your same degree program. Like, like going through life, even your coworkers, like you are kind of set in environments where you don't have a big, uh, a large amount of decision on who your friends are. And then you become an adult and we're like, hey, just kind of figure it out. And for some of you, you're like, well, I just all my coworkers, but like, Maybe your coworkers aren't gonna really push you to do loving and good things. For some of you, well, it's just my neighbors. Well, I mean, how many of you, real talk, like how many of us even know our neighbors? Again, we can get to a place where we, instead of stepping in the direction of people, we go, well, we'll be all right. I got enough time, I can just scroll on my phone, I can just connect people that way. I know all the like, life situations happen with people, but it's not that real community. But the, the issue is that you are being formed into something in life. There is an inner person in you being formed to something and your environments, your habits, and your relationships form who you become. And this is why the author of Hebrews is saying, if you want to live a life full of love and good deeds, because I believe most of us want that. Probably all of us want that. You want to be loving. You want to do good things to people around you. If you want to live this way, this is a cheat code, which you should take every cheat code you can find. If someone got there first and learned how and they give you advice, you should take that advice. And this is what the author of Hebrews says. Something you may not think would be the solution. He says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Now you see, even in your English Bible, that word day is capitalized because he's talking about a specific day. He's saying, and with the early church believe this, and we would believe this here at Center Point, is that there is a day when Jesus is coming back and he is going to restore things as they should be. I think most of us can acknowledge, like, the world is not as it should be. And Jesus will come back and he will restore it. So there is a day. But there's also, in our lives, there's a lot of other days that we may or may not see approaching. Days that are pivotal in your story. And generally we understand it and we see the good days coming. Right? It's the graduation, it's the, the engagement, it's the promotion, it's the wedding, it's you bought a house. Like those big positive days, you're like, man, I saw that coming, we prepared for it, we worked harder for it. You know what you don't see coming a lot of the time? The hardest days. The day that instead of the marriage going well, they said, hey, I'm out. 
the day you lost your job, the day you got the diagn- that diagnosis, the day that you go, man, everything around me is falling apart. You have those days and you've had those days. I've had those days. And do you know who we need on those days? Not a big group of people that I relate to. I need a circle. I need a few people that I can trust. And again, this is the reality. You can't control the situations you face, but you can control the circle you sit in. So my desire is to help you see how to choose the best circle you can because your few influences what you do. And simply just gravitate into the easiest circle in your life may not be the best circle for you. So I think you should be in a group. That's how we do that here at Center of Point. But I also want to tell you, if you're a parent, like your kids need a few. Like your kids need people around them. And we've been blessed with our family uh, because we have prioritized being in church. Now, admittedly, like I'm a pastor, so it's a little bit easier because it's literally my job. But it's not my kid's job. And for us, we've prioritized being in church. And this is where we have seen the benefit of our kids walking with people for years and years. I think about Crystal. She's right there. She has been a small group leader in our preschool ministry for years. She's had almost all of our kids go through her small group. Thank you for loving our kids. She's such a good job. I think about, I think about Ms. Christina. And she's a first grade small group leader. She's loved on our older girls because they've gone through her room and they love her. They run up to her, give her a big hug. And she talks to them. I want every loving, safe parent or adult to be able to impact my kids. I think about Tad, who Tad was a second grade small group leader. And he, if you have a second grader, you probably or will get one of these Bibles. He buys all the small group, lead, or small group kids in his group, these action Bibles where it's like a comic book Bible. He's like, I just want these kids to love reading the Bible. So he buys them and gives them out to kids like hotcakes. He just gives them out to every kid in his small group. And Lucy, our daughter, when she wants to read the Bible, she doesn't go get the Bible mom and dad bought her. She goes and gets the Bible that Mr. Tad got her. I think about Corey, who's our daughter, our oldest daughter's small group leader this past year. And he, uh, Man, my, her birthday fell on a Sunday, and I was like, hey, you know, like, we prioritize church, but also it's a special day for you. You want dad, I'll take the day off. We'll just hang out here. And she said, no, I don't want to take the day off. I want to go because Corey's birthday is the day before my birthday. And I want to go. We're going to celebrate on Sunday and have cupcakes together. Your kid needs a few. This is why I tell you, you should be at church, and your kids should be in kids because they design their spaces with so much intention to build relationships. But also, so I'd say, your student needs a few. Now, I have not parented uh, students yet. We're getting there every single day. We get closer and closer. From what I've heard, it's really tough to parent students. But I've also heard it's really tough being a student. You're navigating life. You're trying to figure out things. And being a student in 2024 is so different than when your parents or myself, when we were your age. It just is so different. Your student needs a few around them to care for them. And I would love it if your kids would talk to you about everything under the sun, but they're not going to. And we have loving, safe small groups and small group leaders to build in, which again, you should want every safe, loving adult that can impact your kid to impact them. And they may talk to the small group leader about things. And our small group leaders are trained that this is when we bring it to a parent because we don't, we don't ever do anything outside of the home, outside of the parent. But we work to help these students navigate some things. And, and also, this I just say too, I've seen through my years of working with student ministry, working with kids ministry, that generally parents, about the time that a student can drive themselves, parents make church optional, or at least student ministry optional. I tell you that when I got my license, I'd love to tell you I did all the good, right things. I didn't. I had more freedom. I could do things. I could lie to my parents about things to go do. Like, like the reality is the time your student starts to drive is not the time to just open up and go, hey, it's up to you if you want to be involved and have a few. You should prioritize for your student. You will be at student ministry so you can have some other kids around you walking through your life, but also loving, safe, caring adults to impact them because you should want every caring adult that could impact your kid to be able to do that. But not just your kids and not just your students, but you need a few. You need a group of people that you can relate to and that you can build trust with. Not that you have to be open and share all your stuff. To be honest, we don't really want you to do that in a group. It's a little uncomfortable for everybody. And it's like, hey, we'll like go find you to go counseling because like you're taking over the group. Talk about all your stuff. Like 
We want you to have people you can share openly and honestly with, and they can share openly and honestly with you. And the way we do that, the way we help set you up to have those meaningful relationships is through groups. Our groups are set around three primary things. It's you relate to others, you build trust, and you grow spiritually. You relate to others, like you should like the people in your group. Now, are, are, is everyone in your group going to be best friends? Chances are, no. But will you have a few people that you're like, man, like of all these people, I relate to them. We have good relationships. And then maybe there's a few that even better relationships. I trust them a little more. I'll open up about a few things. And you build trust in your group where it's a safe space to talk about life, to be real about life, to share and walk through life. But then also you want to grow spiritually. We want to help you. We believe there is something forming in you and I believe I'm the most loving version of myself when the inner person that I'm forming looks the most like Jesus. I think that's true of you too. So we want to help you take a step. Again, I've told you, my whole goal today, we've been planning this for weeks. I actually, man, I am like the closer of these last several weeks to like get you to join a group. I get a bonus depending on how many people join groups today. So <laughs> if you can help me out, join a group and write down Justin and I'll talk with Brian. It'll be really good. But, but this is the reality. For so many of you, I know this doesn't feel urgent. And there's a lot of things in your life that did not feel urgent that now you're like, man, if we could have started this years ago, man, how different would it have been? This is what I believe that when you get in a group, and I've seen this true in my life, you begin preparing a circle of people for when life doesn't go as you planned because life's not going to go as you planned. And when you encounter something that you can't handle alone, that I would argue you were never meant to handle alone, you don't need a bunch of people you relate to. You need a few people that you trust, that you can lean on, but then also that you can be there for them to lean on you. Because that's the beauty of groups. And I'd love if I could just say, hey, your life is gonna be awesome, there'll be no pain or no problems, but the reality is you're gonna encounter some difficult things and you can't control the situations you face, but you can control the circle you sit in. I know you're too busy and you got all this stuff, and you're like, well, I just don't know the Bible, I'm just not sure, and you're nervous about things, I totally get it. Here's what I would encourage you, just try. If you hear earlier, you heard Michelle's story of her just taking a step and showing up at an event and meeting some people she related with. And her life has changed dramatically over the last year, not because she showed up and prayed a whole bunch to Jesus. I'm sure that helped, but because she showed up and she was in a circle with other people and she shared her life and they shared their lives with her. Hey, I've seen this in my life. So I wanna push you, I wanna challenge you, I wanna encourage you, take a step. I also want to say, I know some of you in the room, you are not too busy. You do not feel like you don't know enough. You are worried that you are too messed up. Like, man, if you knew what was going on in our marriage, if you knew what this week, you knew like the inner me, like, and you feel hopeless and helpless. I'll tell you, if you knew the stories of the people in groups in our church, you would know you fit in. Nobody has it all together. The people that pretend they have it all together are just that, they are pretenders. And consider the alternative. Is it better to just go, well, I feel so much shame. When you feel shame, isolation is not the solution community is. And we want to invite you into a group because you can't control the situations you face in life. You can't control the situations you have faced in life, but you can control the circle you sit in. I would love for you to join a group and see that it is true that being in a circle is better than simply showing up and being in a row. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for today. I thank you for the stories of, of so many people. I thank you and Michelle sharing her story today. God, the impact that community has had on people. And God, I ask that you would help us to recognize the objections that we're bringing up of being too busy or, or being nervous or being too messed up. And God, that we would, God, we would rest in the reality that we are welcome to join a group. God, that we are worth sitting in a circle with. 
And God, I know even a room like this or people online or podcasts, God, it's so easy to think that we're not worthy of it, but we are. I just ask that you would help us take a step to join a group today and God, that you would use the people in that community to impact our lives, but also use us to impact their lives. We love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.